Welcome to the City Council meeting. If everyone could take a moment and silence their cell phones. <clears throat> and please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have um, two proclamations on our agenda for tonight, and the first one is March 30th, 2019, as Arbor Day, and Don Chavez is here somewhere to receive this proclamation, and Council Member Julie Mayfield will present the proclamation. do about trees today. This is just a proclamation about Arbor Day, uh, and so I will get to it. Whereas Arbor Day is celebrated to promote the importance of planting and caring for trees in our community, and whereas Arbor Day originated in Nebraska and is now celebrated in 27 countries worldwide, whereas Arbor Day demonstrates the value of forest preservation and the importance of caring for trees in our everyday lives, and whereas trees keep our forests healthy and growing, providing sustainable sources of wood and other valuable materials, and whereas trees improve air and water quality and provide beautiful aesthetic values to our communities. Now, therefore, I, Esther E. Mannheimer, Mayor of the City of Asheville, do hereby proclaim March 30th, 2019 as Harbor Day in Asheville and urge all citizens to plant, nurture, and celebrate trees. And I will, yeah, that's, that's applause. Appropriate. <laughs> it over to Don Chavez, who is the executive director of Asheville Greenworks, which is one of the city's great partners and our major tree protector here in town. Thank you, Julie. Uh, we just want to thank you for acknowledging Arbor Day uh, this, this Saturday, March 30th. Asheville Greenworks will be celebrating by giving away 400 trees for free to our community um, to plant and take care of. So thank you for this honor. Thanks everybody for coming. And yay trees! Julie, will you stay up there with everyone and receive the Tree City USA Award? If Dylan Michael is sure. here. Oh, okay. There, see? <laughs> so my name is Dylan. I'm the county ranger with the State Forest Service and I serve here in Buncombe County. A few things I want to talk about for Asheville's Tree City USA Award. Um, Asheville is one of 87 cities um, and towns in North Carolina with other 3,400 in the nation to receive this award in 2018, uh, which actually marks the 39th year Asheville has received this award, so congratulations. Um, established in 1976, the Tree City USA Award Program is sponsored by the National Arbor Day Foundation in cooperation with the National State Foresters Association that recognizes communities that make planting and caring for trees a priority like Asheville has. There are nearly four million residents in North Carolina who live in tree cities, from Charlotte with more than 800,000 residents to the town of Bath with 250. Um, tree City USA program in North Carolina is administered by the North Carolina Forest Service, which is why I'm here today to present this award. Um, this award encourages management of urban trees for a healthy, sustainable urban forest that reduces energy costs, consumption, boosts property values, builds strong community ties, and honors the community. In 2018, Asheville accomplished four criteria to receive this award. Number one, they maintained a public tree ordinance which establishes policies for managing trees 
that are in uh, streets and parks, a tree board that is responsible for care and management of the community's trees, a community forestry program with an annual budget of at least $2 per capita, and um, a national Arbor Day observance, which will be Saturday, and proclamation to celebrate trees and the many benefits they provide. This is why we are celebrating today. For a community forestry program to be effective, it takes support from and commitment from the entire community. In Asheville, the community forestry program thrives because of the combined dedication of the tree board members, the city staff, elected officials, business community, homeowners, and all residents who take pride in the quality of life in Asheville. So on behalf of the National Arbor Day Foundation, the North Carolina Forest Service, I am pleased to present Asheville with your 2018 Tree City USA Award. Congratulations. Hi, my name is Amy Smith. I'm the Vice Chair of the Asheville City Tree Commission. So on behalf of the Tree Commission and the City of Asheville, we are proud to be recognized as a tree city for our 39th year. The Tree Commission, along with our community members and the Tree Protection Task Force, are committed to tree protection, preservation, and enhancement. We recognize the many benefits of urban forests, including recreation, beautification, stormwater mitigation, climate resilience, and habitat for birds and other wildlife. And we appreciate the City Council in supporting us and the community in continuing to protect our urban forest. Thank you. And I know we have a number of members of our tree, current and former members of our tree commission here. So if you could, if you were firm, currently or formerly on our tree commission, raise your hand. Raise, raise it high. Show people. That's great. All right. Good. Thank you very much for your service and thanks everybody else for coming. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Now, everyone who is here for trees, you are welcome to stay for this whole council meeting, or I would just offer you, this might be a window where you, okay, you can stay, you can go. Um, one final item mm -hmm. under proclamations, we want to have a moment to recognize our friend Dewana Little, who is here, I think somewhere, come on up, Dewana. Mm -hmm. for coming down here today. This is just a special opportunity for us to recognize your new position. Duana Little was named by Governor Roy Cooper as the chair of the North Carolina Financial Literacy Council. Woo. And we know you will be a strong voice on the council just as you are here in Asheville. Um, I want to just congratulate you and thank you for your commitment to our community. Uh, if you don't know, Dewana already serves on the Affordable Housing Advisory Committee. She has served as the chair of our Blue Ribbon Committee to create the Asheville Human Relations Commission, and as well as countless hours volunteering in our community. So thank you and congratulations. Um, all right, folks, we get a chance to do our consent agenda more smoothly than we did last time. <laughs> Are there any questions, comments um, regarding any item on the consent agenda or any item that anyone wants to have considered separately? Or first on council, any questions? I'm gonna, okay, so now I need a motion to adopt the consent agenda. Motion to adopt the consent agenda. And I need a second. 
Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second to adopt the consent agenda. Is there anyone wishing to comment on the motion to adopt the consent agenda? This, yes, sir. I'm uh, Dr. Paul Martin and served as a city physician for 22 years. I'm here again to uh, reiterate my concern about the approval of item J, resolution for physician services at the employee health services from Fletcher Hospital. And I remind you and the public attending here that the city physician is the highest paid city employee, earning nearly twice the <laughs> annualized salary of the city manager and unfortunately 20 times the salary of council. I'm sorry. Uh, the salary is high because of the need for a specialized physician to meet the needs of the, the role. Thus the need for a transparent and deliberate and meticulous selection process. The background document that you see attached to the resolution really understates the necessary qualifications to competently provide the services. It states that the City of Asheville Health Services provides basic medical services. Well, it does that, but indeed, the clinic also provides highly specialized and specific services to firefighters, police officers, commercial drivers that must comply with national standards and regulations that go far beyond the usual services provided in a minute clinic or a family practice. The health center is uh, staffed with oversight by the physician. Indeed, that oversight includes a physician assistant who's a city employee who provides specialized evaluations for those firefighters, police officers, and commercial drivers, and who by North Carolina law must be supervised by a physician with a scope of practice that includes all the services provided by the PA. The Fletcher Hospital physicians lack training, experience, and certifications in these areas. As medical director for the city of Asheville, this position offers consultation and direction on complicated workers' comp cases, injuries, management of bloodborne pathogen exposures, environmental exposures such as mold that's found in our buildings, lead that's found in our firing range, and asbestos that's found in our aging city water pipes. It's important that the physician chosen is qualified to offer these consultations. The current physicians provided by the Fletcher Hospital have no formal training in any of these areas. The two week window for uh, the position that was open for the RFP could not have been better designed to prevent competition with the Fletcher Hospital. After they had been notified of the RFP, no apparent effort was made to recruit a physician practice from Asheville and no targeted effort to recruit a physician with the necessary occupational medicine training. So I would say the next time that you need a cardiologist and a dermatologist shows up instead, it should be okay because they're both physicians, right? That's what we're dealing with here. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else wishing to comment on the motion to approve the consent agenda? Is everybody really hot? Is it hot in here? Is it okay? No, everyone's good. All right. Just I just wanted to ask. It's, I feel like it's gotten really hot. All right. If there aren't any other, sorry, it's not on the consent agenda. All right. We're going to vote on the motion to approve the consent agenda. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Thank you. Um, we have no presentations and reports tonight. We have three items on the public hearings agenda. The, but first, do you want me to do the motion on item B first or you wanna wait till it? Okay, you want me to. All right, um, I need a motion for uh, item B to continue it until April 9th. This is the library. Maybe someone could tell us quickly like why the library has to go till April 9th. Oh, I see. So they want to coordinate the two items. Okay. Yes. All right. I got you. So uh, I, I will move uh, to uh, remove item uh, B, public hearing to consider conditional zoning on property located at 3 Avon Road from Community Business uh, 1. Uh, remove it off this agenda and place it upon the April 9th agenda. Second. Second. Oh. All right, we have a motion and a second to continue item B on the public hearings agenda. Is there anyone wishing to comment on the motion to continue item B until April 9th? 
Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. So turning to item A on the public hearings agenda, this is a public hearing to consider conditional zoning of property located at 155, 137, 129, and 123 Biltmore Avenue from Central Business District to Central Business District Expansion District slash conditional zone for the construction of a 56 room hotel in one new five story building and three existing buildings. And Sasha is here to talk to us about the project. Thank you so much. Good evening, Mayor and City Council members and members of the public. I'm here to present 155, but more for your consideration. This project is a lodging project located on four parcels, uh, including three historic houses and a carriage house at 123, 129, and 137 Biltmore, and also a, a proposal for a new five-story building at 155 Biltmore, which actually is the old location of City Health Services. So the current zoning of this site is all central business district. It is between Biltmore and Lexington Avenue, which are both key pedestrian streets in downtown and south of Hilliard Avenue. And that's just an, an aerial, which is not great to read. If, if this were approved, these sites would be then rezoned to central business district expansion zone, CBDCZ. So I just want to quickly go over the facts and the context of this site. So here on the right are the three historic houses. Those are, houses are protected by a preservation easement that is held by the Preservation Society of Asheville and Buncombe County, which prevents the demolition of these buildings. There's also a small carriage house here in the rear, which is also covered by that easement. So there would be 20 rooms in these three, room, in these three buildings, excuse me, and as well as reception, I believe, well, hotel lobby. Um, just quickly, th there's existing parking here that would stay. There is existing parking here that would go away and it becomes an event lawn with kind of a new retaining wall and landscaping there. <coughs> the <coughs> new five-story building is being proposed here at 155. Um, it has a courtyard on the northern side, which is deeper than we usually allow under our CBD code. Both staff and the downtown commission were supportive of this change or this deviation from the, the normal rules because it's providing light and air to 144 Biltmore, which is under construction right now. So I will, I did, um, I just wanted quickly just to remind folks, if you, to remind what, everyone what these houses look like. They're, you know, pretty old structures and remnants of, of an older time in Asheville. This is the Lexington side of those houses. This is the existing parking lot that would remain. And there's lots of trees, so it's harder to see some of the areas. <clears throat> the, the building at 155, as I've said, would be a five-story building. Um, the design it went through downtown design review at the downtown commission. Um, the downtown commission actually ended up voting not in favor of it, but it was because of there was not a habitable story on the Lexington side. Our CBD expansion code asks for, if you're going to have a parking structure, we want you to put some activated space along the street. So they didn't have that. Since then, that design has changed. And now here, this is the Lexington elevation on the bottom. You can see they've added some storefront. And I believe part of it is part of their restaurant. And it's, it's more activated now. So, so Sasha, just to, so, so for the, reason, the reason that it was rejected by the downtown commission has now been fixed, is that? Correct. They, as a part of their submittal for downtown design review, they're required to sorry, um, model and do renderings of the new building. These are smaller pictures, which um, you got in your packets. Um, so just speaking of the context, let me go to the bottom building. This is, um, so here we have Wild Wings on the left. This is the proposed five-story building right there, and it, next to 144 Biltmore, which 145, excuse me, is an even taller building. So this is actually moderating the height between the two-story building where Wild Wings is and the new building that's under construction today. Here's another view of that as well. This is a little bit confusing because okay. the building on I'm the sorry. right is, is not at issue 
at tonight's hearing. Correct. That's already that was happening. already approved. That was approved under level two <clears throat> approval. That didn't come to council. It did not come to two. council at all. Mm -hmm. And that's not built yet. It's under, it's under construction, construction today. Yeah, it's in process. Mm -hmm. Sorry. But the renderings were required to assume it's full mm -hmm. built out status. Yeah, and the, and the developers of 145 shared that with, you know, 155 and, you know, provides that building, that courtyard. Here's a, here's a, a kind of a closer up picture of that courtyard. So here's the buildings at the street, and then there's this deeper courtyard than we would usually have in downtown. Let me... So just um, really quickly <coughs> before I go on to the future land use plan, um, in general, staff um, is in support of the project. It's you know, generally compatible with the surrounding area. Sasha, can you zoom it out a little bit? Sure. It's oh, thank you. <laughs> um, going back to the site plan, some things to know are that um, the usual standard for a CBD conditional zone is one driveway per development. This, this development split by a parcel in the middle, so it would make sense to have one driveway per side of that, if you will. They're requesting three. So there's one driveway here for the new building on Lexington that goes into the underground parking garage. There's one driveway here that's existing that goes into the parking on the rear. And there's one driveway here that is also existing it's a hist kind of historic walls are lining it, and it would really just be used for service. It's not going to be a main driveway. But they are closing, I believe, one or two, a driveway here at 155 and a driveway here. Actually, there's two driveways here today at 155. So they're closing some driveways. So that's an that's a improvement from a pedestrian experience. And Sasha, aren't they also including a pedestrian connection from Biltmore to Lexington? Where is that? Um, I will let them talk about that. This, okay. I believe there's a pedestrian connection here along 145. Okay. I'm, because I've been working on both these projects, I'm, I get confused about who's providing that. Okay. I believe they are providing that. Um, yes. Okay. Thank you. I'd forgotten about that. Um, <clears throat> so the future land use map, um, when we look at consistency with our comprehensive plan, um, you know, downtown is its own future land use area category. And uh, a part of that, um, that description of that area, basically it helps me to actually quote the comp plan because it's the most useful thing. It says, lodging is essential to the mix of uses downtown. While additional lodging uses may be appropriate, they may, must be considered in context with other developments so that the variety and mix of uses which give downtown its distinctive character is not compromised. So the comp plan is advising us we really need to keep those, all those things in consideration because if we get too out of balance, that's not a great thing for our downtown economy. We actually don't have a particular measure of how you measure that here. Um, there aren't a lot of hotels in this area south of college. There's the Aloft, which is the closest hotel, and I think recently council just approved a hotel further down the hill across from Matthews Ford. So those would be the two closest hotel sites um, in this area. So otherwise, um, I think depending on who you talk to, this, this area of Biltmore could use some help in terms of activating it and keeping it with active with uses. But we know there's concern about lodging uses in downtown in general. Um, and I think that really concludes my presentation. If you have any questions for me. Anyone have any questions? I get the one thing I should also say, sorry, is that generally speaking, how we're evaluating these hotel projects is um, for downtown, we require a 12-foot sidewalk on the primary access corridor, which is Biltmore, and that's being provided here. In front of these historic houses, there is a historic wall, which prevents from widening that sidewalk. So it's really most closest to about seven feet for most of that frontage. And this is a DOT right-of-way. On the rear, Lexington has a 10-foot sidewalk all the way up to about this driveway, and then it, it's just a little bit smaller on that northern portion. So. And Sasha, is the parking that the 18 spaces back there, is that parking that's all dedicated to, to, to the lodging uses, or is that public parking yes, as well? No, it's all for lodging, I, I believe. I'll, I'll let the applicant okay. address that. We can There's, ask. Um, I believe, 20, 
some spaces in the in the 155 building, and then these spaces for the, the lodging. Okay. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, members of Council. My name is Chris Day. I'm with Civil Design Concepts, and I'll go over just a couple of brief technical points and <clears throat> clarifications. I do want to thank Sasha, all of staff, and the many volunteers who have worked on the boards that have reviewed and given input on this project um, that you see before here for you tonight. Um, we appreciate the opportunity to work with this developer. Um, they've recently completed a residential project at 45 Ashland. Um, as Sasha made reference, the project next door at 145 Biltmore is underway and we are working with the developer and Mountain Housing on a mixed-use project in the Central Business District to provide retail, office, and affordable housing. That project actually has its uh, first neighborhood meeting tomorrow. Um, this location, as uh, Sasha made reference, is here between Wild Wings and the old Andes slash Bar Taco location. My office has experience with uh, this site over the years, uh, a number of years ago before this developer um, came into the picture, an out of town group was looking to wipe all of this out. Um, we appreciate the fact that the project before you tonight, um, that the buildings now have preservation on them, that this site plan and the proposed project will preserve those historic structures, and that is um, being insured by the Preservation Society of Asheville, as well as detailed by Roadhouse Architects, a local architecture firm that specializes in that type of work. Robin Rains from Roadhouse is here tonight if you have any questions as we move forward. The site layout, as Sasha made reference, we do, um, we are eliminating curb cuts. There's a couple of curb cuts that are be eliminating here. There's also a curb cut here that will be converted to pedestrian access only. Um, the sidewalk is widened here. We're preserving the historic wall here and we'll maintain the existing sidewalk. As Sasha made reference in the back, back here, we're asking to maintain the existing sidewalk and that's to preserve some um, mature trees in that area. Downtown Commission um, felt that that was, uh, that that was um, something that they were in agreement with. Downtown Commission did make a recommendation um, their, actually their denial was in association <laughs> with the fact that we did not have habitable space lining Lexington Avenue. This plan shows the revised um, layout that went to planning and zoning where this was converted to a retail space and um, hotel access with the, um, just the, the vehicular access coming in on the back. There was a question about the 18 parking spaces and um, that parking, while today it is private parking, um, we are uh, proposing that it become um, publicly accessible parking um, with, this, with this project. At that, I think I'm available for questions, but I'll introduce Eugene Ellison who will summarize and close our presentation. Just ask one thing. Sure. Um, <clears throat> Thank you for that, Chris. Uh, so the permanent protection by the, for the preservation easement um, is in effect right now or will go into effect if this project is approved? No, it is in effect right now. Um, and so this, this project really doesn't have any effect on preserving the buildings? No, um, it's my understanding that um, this organization was uh, responsible for, for working that out with the Preservation Society sometime in the last year or so. Um, when I looked at this property for an out-of-town developer, it was about three years ago. <clears throat> Thank you. So, so Chris, just to be clear about that, it's these, it's the people who are proposing this project who put the conservation easements on those buildings. That's what I understand. Okay. All right. And just a question about the parking, if, do we, should we, if, if that's going to be made available for public parking, does that need to be reflected in the conditions? It's not right now. Right. It, it just says the parking lot on South Lexington behind the historic houses will remain, but it yes, doesn't. It, it should. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. 
and we're agreeable to that. Maybe there's a way to, to amend it. I'm available for follow-up uh, I can questions. The B1, yeah. yeah. I can suggest that. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor and members of City Council. The city Manager, good to see you. Uh, I think this is a great project for the South Slope. It used to be the, for about 15 years at the corner there at 185 Biltmore, as you know, was torn down for parking there. I would, came before you in support of a project 145 Biltmore. My client was Mr. Walter Wills, who since you approved that had passed, probably prior to your approval, and was working with Mr. Sneeden in this project. So they sit right in the middle. 145 is right in the middle of 155. It's, uh, you know, we always talked about having a great interest in downtown, a great corridor. I think this provides that, uh, a great corridor interest from the south, south side of Asheville. Saving those four historic houses to be guaranteed by historic easements that's held by the Historic Society, I think is a great plus to our city. Providing the public accessibility, parking is always an issue downtown. Those 18 spaces, I think, is a great asset to our city. Maggie, the light. Maggie, the, the light. His light's going to go off. His, which, your Sorry. Time. Yeah, Sorry. We just got to mix up on your time. I've got my sander right here, too, Mayor. <laughs> <laughs> the developer in Mountain Housing, you know, they're working on a mixed use project at the corner of Hilliard and Clayman on some uh, 38 affordable properties. Uh, this is an approval process showing their commitment to our city and your interest in having more affordable housing in Asheville. The Family Lodge is different from the downtown hospitality offices. They offer one-bedroom kitchens and they're family-friendly, open grounds and a garden and historic houses and an open plaza bring something different to downtown. It also focuses on your interest in improving pedestrian experience by eliminating those vehicle interests on Biltmore Avenue. And then they improved that Lexington corridor where the area was overgrown and added a, a safe, open, wide sidewalk, as you requested, in pedestrian traffic. It provides outdoor open space, green garden space, uh, the preservation of historic houses versus tearing those houses down. There's not a whole lot can be done since you can't have residential housing there. Uh, this is a great asset. The downtown commissions, their concerns were addressed. The staff has recommended the project they're working in line with your 2036 council vision as being a pedestrian friendly and preserved four historic structures and the carriage houses. These developers are experienced and they are interested in our city. Uh, Al, who is here today, Sneedon, he and his wife, his wife's from the area. They since sold their home and moved to Asheville, working on a brand new project uh, that your housing commission is interested in and in trying to get more home ownership affordable working with the uh, city's housing trust and ownership project they're committed to that they're working on that project have already purchased the land and working on designs uh, for housing so these people are not just here to put in lodging in a hotel and leave town they are here committed to the city they're here committed to working with you and being a partner with the city to develop all type of diversity housing so folks can again uh, own, it's tough to home, own property in Asheville if you're not at a certain income level. And they're trying to help bridge that. So we see this as a great opportunity. Not only that, they pay a living wage. And the people that they employ are local. Uh, they're contractors, subcontractors, the hotel management's committed, the architects, interior design, the restaurant partner. Everyone's committed to living wage and they're committed to doing the type of things that you do and that you want to make this a diverse and a complete and good city. So with that, uh, I'll take any questions you have. Uh, I think Robin is here to answer any questions. Al is here. If you have any other questions, I'll take any if you have. Okay. This, this may be a question for, for Chris. In terms, of, in terms of the houses themselves, can you talk a little bit about what, you know, what is going to be done to them internally and, and what sort of code is, is, is you all going to, you know, what, what, what that's going to meet and, and in terms of the, part of what I'm trying to get at here is, is there may be a preservation easement on here, but actually maintaining those homes is, is going to cost a fair amount of money. And I'm trying to get a sense from you all what, what that's going to entail for this project. Good evening. I'm Robin Rains with Row House Architects. 
Um, we have already worked on the drawings. Um, we've gotten as built to the drawings and we're working with uh, co compiling a part two to send to uh, the state. And um, we're going to keep as much of the interior space as as is and we're going to reuse that in the in the rooms we're dividing the spaces leaving the existing rooms existing woodwork um existing fireplace locations and things like that so the houses are going to be restored back to as much of the historical originality as possible any other questions of the applicant <coughs> yes i have I, one i'm sorry go ahead no i Go ahead, Keith. I well, you were, you're talking about the preservation of the homes. I was wanting to I was wanting to go a little bit more in depth about what the upkeep of, of uh, VJ's question was, what the upkeep of the, the property would be, what the condition of the homes are in now, and what does that entail over time? What can you do and not do as opposed to with those preservation easements on the house? The houses, the two most southern houses are in pretty bad shape. Um, they've not been occupied for a little while and um, people have been getting in and out of them. So they're not in great shape. So those need much more work than the most northern house, which has been occupied by a law firm until recently. So that one won't need quite as much work to get it back to where it needs to be. Um, the uh, state has pretty strict rules and regulations on what you can do to a historic structure to receive tax credits, and that's the goal. So we're gonna work with the state, and um, they're gonna make us keep quite a bit of it intact. Um, is there anything, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut no. you off there, but is there anything <coughs> that stipulates you have to, I mean, on a schedule, make sure that things are kept in a pristine condition? Not saying that you won't, but right, right. just wanted to, make sure I'm not I'm not sure about that so you said the houses the houses are not in good condition right now right are they under a preservation easement or are they are they I don't protected think they right have now until now yeah, is this could you come to the the mic they they are under a preservation now. easement we've that's only under it's been year. recorded it's yeah it was done a year ago or something but so what I, what I think that means so I guess what I'm getting at is we're talking about protecting in these houses I guess in some sense are they protected now? And then you said the, the, the two houses at the right hand of the slot are not in good condition. If they're protected now, but these houses are not in good condition, what is there, is there any sort of enforcement to keep the houses in good condition? I mean, no? I, I think the easement means that you can't tear them down or make any modifications to the outside. Uh, my partners bought the houses and put them in that easement for the purpose of creating uh, the hospitality you said we have now. Office, it was used for office right now. It could have been used for residential too. Um, tenants tend to not want to push landlords to make improvements. I thought the zoning restricted single family use. Well, they, they may. I'm, I'm just saying for a historic house, if, if you spend money on it, then the landlord's going to want more, more rent. For hospitality use, we have to have those looking good every day or people will write bad reviews that they won't come. So, so the answer to the question from a legal standpoint, what I think is, is if you're going to do something to these properties, you have to follow the rules and regs in place. There's nothing that requires that you keep them up on an annual basis. I mean, if they were to deteriorate over the time, not saying you would, but if they were, there's not an enforcement mechanism that requires that they be kept up. Just when you do stuff to them, you got to follow the rules. Mm -hmm. And the easement means you can't tear them down. And you can't tear them down, right. But may I ask a quick, I'm sorry, um, the, the rooms in the building, the, those three old, older homes, are those going to be extended stay rooms? No, no. They, they will be uh, night, not it, they won't be uh, So they kitchens. won't have kitchen ends no, or anything? <coughs> There may be there may be one kitchen in the Maybe bottom, the which would be for um, a family or something if they were staying there, or a meeting uh, so that they could cater a meal. But there would not be one for each room. Will you state your name for Maggie? Oh, sure. Uh, Al Sneed, <coughs> the developer of the project. Any other questions uh, of the uh, applicants? I, I have a question about the. Uh, hey Brian, will you pull your? I'm sorry. Uh, I have a question about the rooms themselves, the other rooms, and. and in the new construction uh, as to uh, the amenities in these rooms. Uh, uh, I think all the other rooms that are not in the historical houses uh, will have 
bedrooms. Mm -hmm. We'll have kitchens. Yes, they are. They will uh, be a one bedroom format. They'll have a bedroom with a living room area, and the living room area will have a fold out um, couch. And there's going to be a small, very small kitchen in each one. So, so these rooms could accommodate how many folks? Um, <coughs> four. Okay. Um, that's it there. Thank you. Any other questions for the applicant or Sasha? Okay, I'm going to open the public hearing. Um, folks, when we do the public hearing, you'll have three minutes to speak. Just watch the lights on the lectern. It'll green means go, orange, yellow means slow down. No, don't slow down. It means you're almost done, and red means stop. And you'll need to state your name. And luckily, we have Dave Nutters, our first speaker, to demonstrate how this is done. Mayor, <laughs> members of council. <laughs> <laughs> For real. And city manager. I am David Nutter, an Asheville resident, a certified city planner, and an experienced historic preservationist. I love downtown, Lexington and Biltmore Avenues, and the dynamic South Slope and South Side. I am testifying as an individual to support the 155 Biltmore Historic Properties and Hotel and Mixed Use Project. I understand that the 56-room hotel is likely to be council's sticking point. I believe I understand that this same element is the economic catalyst that gives feasibility to the entire project. I have previous hotel market analysis, feasibility, and development experience as I served as director of the Broadway Project Corporation in Louisville for the restoration of the historic Grand Hotel. I have served on the board of our community's Western North Carolina Historical Association, the city's Historic Resources <coughs> Commission, and now the Preservation Society. I know that the society has negotiated preservation easements for the three majestic historic houses which line Biltmore and Lexington Avenues. I advocate this for the following reasons. It occupies a strategic city junction. It will help us define a workable hotels policy based on special benefits that cannot be achieved in any other way. It will expand the cause of downtown revival, a cause that will never end, but pays off for thousands of citizens. It will help bring a now desultory Biltmore Avenue to life along a weak stretch. It will abet healthy pedestrian and biking activity. It will help carry out a working vision for the South Slope and South Side by providing a new gateway to and from Biltmore Avenue. It will help make historic preservation part of the main game of the city. The excellent planning and design staff report makes it clear that the project is consistent with council's vision, the Living Asheville Comprehensive Plan, and the city's downtown design standards. The Planning and Zoning Commission is in favor. Above all, it offers what Asheville needs at this location, a burst of mixed use, design, preservation, and economic vitality. I believe it offers the spirit and pluck of Asheville in a dangerously conservative age. I wish you luck with other conditional requirements like affording housing exactions. I do wish we asked for market analysis or did some ourselves. I recommend that you approve this valuable project. Thank you. Um, is there anyone else wishing to speak on this? Matt? Yes. Mayor Council, I'm Peter Landis. I live downtown. I, I have a question, actually. I see that there's an event space called for here with a stage, and I'm wondering what kind of noise it would likely generate and the effects it would have on other residents in the neighborhood. Is that, are you talking about the event lawn? Yes. Yes, okay. Um, well, so we're in the middle of the public hearing, but maybe Sasha, you could take note of that question and when we're done, um, get, see if we can address some of those. Um, okay, anyone else wishing to speak on this item? Yes. <coughs> Mayor, 
Hello, my name is Chris Smith. I'm vice president and part owner in Beverly Grant, who is a local general contracting firm, family-owned firm that's been here since 1955. Um, I wanted to speak on behalf of putting my Beverly Grant hat on for part of this, but also I'm a true Asheville native. I was born and raised here, and I'm lucky enough to uh, be part of the family business. I met uh, Al Sneeden and his partners uh, a little over three years ago and was uh, blessed with the fact that they truly sought out a local team, not only at the general contracting level, but all the way through their design staff. You heard from Chris Day earlier. Uh, you've heard from Row House Architecture. We're able to pass that on to the subcontractor level. So during the entire process of the construction from the very beginning all the way to when we're completed with the project, I would venture to say between 80 and 90 percent of the money is spent with local general contracting firms and subcontractors. Uh, we were the general contractor on the 45 Ashland project. We were able to hit that percentage with local involvement on that project. We plan to do the same thing here. We're currently doing it for the 145 Biltmore project that's under construction. Um, so it means a lot to me as an Asheville native and a, and a business owner here in town to not have an out-of-town developer, you heard the comment earlier of coming in, doing their one project, making as much money as they can and disappearing, and that's not at all what this developer is. So that's refreshing uh, to a company that competes with folks that have that mindset when they come to our town. Um, so just to recap, uh, these are true community developers. You've heard about some of the other projects they plan to do in this community. We're already helping them with due diligence on those projects. And all of that is going to be locally hired staff. We do pay a living wage at Beverly Grant and our subcontractors do the same. So uh, I'm certainly in support of this project for those reasons. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak on this project? Okay, going once, going twice. All right, I'm going to close the public hearing. Um, Sasha, if you know anything about the event lawn or maybe the developer, maybe Chris can speak to it. Yes, I'll clear up Mr. Landis's question. So the intention of the event lawn, um, it is not for rock and roll concerts. The, <laughs> the, the developer also has uh, his own residence in the condos next door. Um, while I think it's, it's actually kind of labeled as such, it's intended for um, smaller events and you know that the whole project is intended to be more family based and focused with other amenity areas on the site but um, that's not intended to be a, a large stage and, um, and is that an event space again that would be able to be rented by members of the public if you had a small party or something like that I think it's more possibly a wedding yeah small, the, small try to try to the thought process was more behind um, weddings or small family events. Like associated with people who were staying in the in the hotel? Mr. Sneed, can you we'll, come we'll to the We'll have to, yeah. yeah, either. No, you're, I wasn't sure if Chris was just going to say everything. There's nothing wrong with beer venues, but we're not going to be a beer venue. We're a family lodge. We'll have, you know, like a Shakespeare in the park. We'll have a, a family meeting. It, it will be a low-key uh, okay. event. Shakespeare in the park can get kind of rowdy. Um, okay. is, is there any further room for questions or yeah, for the me? Yes. Please fire away. We'll see who can answer. Okay. <laughs> um, so if, if I if I understand things correctly, uh, uh, you also developed 45 Ashland, uh, and are the developer at 145 Biltmore? Is that correct? So why don't you come on up because now we'll, Cause we can't if we're going to have a little back and forth here. So the answer to that was yes. That's correct. Yes. Okay. Uh, and both of those <coughs> developments or properties uh, are luxury condos that came in before we changed uh, the short-term rental rules and uh, these could no longer, they, they can be marketed and sold as short-term rentals. Yes, but we only have a few floors in each building that are for short-term rental. The rest of them are full-time condominium uh, owners. Okay. Um, so it, it makes me wonder that uh, if we had not changed this rule, uh, would this development also be luxury condominiums, uh, where I would much prefer luxury condominiums to hotels, 
uh, any additional hotels in this city. Uh, this almost, to me, just seems like an end round since we <coughs> changed the rule where you can no longer market uh, condominiums at an inflated price because they can be used as a short-term rental, but this is another, just an end round there. We looked at a lot of uh, alternatives. This was the best alternative. Uh, we wanted to support the three historic houses and needed a structure or a, a management uh, center for that. You're talking about with regard to the three houses? No, I'm not, I'm, I'm not talking about the, the three houses. You were asking about 155 if we would have done another condominium building there instead of a hotel. Was that your question? Yes. And the answer to that is no, because we wanted to support the three historic houses. And, that, and so, that your, so your statement is that's the only way you can afford, support the three historic For houses. For the level of uh, repair and upkeep of those houses, yes. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions from council? We, I have closed the public hearing, but if you, if you all have any other questions of staff or council, or, or the applicant, that is fine. Okay. Yo, oh, yes, come on. Sure. Uh, members of council, um, staff noticed that the condition for public parking on the South Lexington lot was not in there. And so the applicant has agreed to that, to have 18, so I've written it, the project will provide 18 spaces on South Lexington Avenue and they will be publicly available. Okay. That's the 18th condition. An 18th condition, okay. And Sasha, uh, right now, and maybe the applicant knows this, right now those are, those are private spaces, right? Is that correct? So They weren't really, they just weren't specified and it's not in the conditions. Okay, any other questions? Do you have a question? Okay. Comments or a motion? Uh, I'd like to make a comment. Uh, Go ahead. Just that uh, I don't know why people keep coming, bring, bringing these hotels to us, but uh, I suppose they're going to keep on coming as long as we're approving them. Um, anytime we add another luxury hotel in our downtown, all we're doing is making the affordability of this city just continue to rise. Uh, people are having to move out of this city on a daily basis because they can't afford to live here. And we don't seem to be doing much to combat that. And uh, uh, I, I will not be supporting this. And um, I, I'm not going to be supporting it. I've talked to the developer a few times and uh, I in, um, I didn't support the extended stay hotel that going across the street from the hospital and this one is the same. I applaud the applicants interest in uh, pr preserving those homes um, and uh, I'd like to see the homes preserved too but not at the expense of building another hotel. And I think I'm in the same boat as Gwen. Um, when we think about historic preservation, I don't think it should come at the expense of um, building another luxury hotel. Um, and we just approved one right up the street. And in my opinion, I'm spent with hotels in this area. Um, so I have to um, vote down on this. So I'll kick off in the other direction. Um, so as I've said, uh, Many times, I look at each one of these projects individually, and the, the way in which I judge them is what, what kind of benefits do they bring to the community um, f in exchange for the, the privilege of doing business here in our community and, and building a new hotel. And for me, um, this one, you know, you know the, it's different for every, for every project, but for me, this one does get over the top for three reasons. Um, number one, the preservation of those three houses. Um, if we, you know, if the project that Chris mentioned that didn't come to fruition, but if somebody had come in and wanted to mow down all three of those houses, we would probably all be extraordinarily upset about that. And so instead we have a developer who um, is, is uh, committed to preserving them, immediately put them under conservation easement upon their purchase, uh, and that's to the benefit of everyone in this community. Uh, number two is the public parking. I think we all know we need, um, we need, we might can use more park, public parking in some parts of downtown and this is probably one of those places. Um, so 
so that, that is a benefit. The third piece, though, is, is a little bit more subtle. If you were listening carefully, you heard it, but it is really the most important thing for me, and that is that um, uh, Mr. Steeden and his partners are, uh, they are not just coming to town to build hotels and luxury condos. They have jumped in um, uh, hand, in fit, hand in hand with mountain housing opportunities and I understand some, and, and are also doing some other affordable housing developments here in town. And so what we have here is a sophisticated private developer um, seemingly uh, well capitalized and can handle major projects who is interested in building affordable housing in our city. We don't really have that otherwise right now. We have we have our great nonprofits, Mountain Housing and Habitat. We have developers who come to us with apartment complexes and things like that, and, and we, can, um, we can secure some affordable housing from them. We do have some small developers who come to us uh, for affordable housing trust fund, uh, uh, grants and things like that to build, again, sort of relatively small, um, small projects. But what we don't have is a big private developer who is willing to dive in um, f with both feet to help us meet our affordable housing challenges. And uh, I see that in this developer, and I want to encourage that, um, that investment, continued investment in our community. So um, for those reasons, I am going to be supporting this, and I'm happy to make a motion at the appropriate time. Uh, like, like Councilwoman Mayfield, I, I, I'm also in, in support of this. You know, again, you know, one of the one of the things that we are charged with as a council as we review these types of projects is um, looking at the standard of review. Uh, and our our uh, one of our requirements, our significant requirement here, is to ensure that this is um, compliant with our comprehensive plan. And as, as staff had indicated, um, it it has. Um, the other thing that I think is very appealing to me on this is this issue of the preservation of these three historic houses. And, and, and I hear some of the concerns that, that some of my fellow council members have about perhaps maybe not wanting to have these buildings be used as lodging, um, that indeed there, are, there is a preservation easement on them. Um, but, but I think that in and of itself, as council member Young's questions had, had, had illuminated, the fact that there is a preservation easement on these properties does not mean they will actually be preserved. Um, they could sit there and they could rot. Uh, and we have to be cognizant of the reality of the amount of money that it costs in order to preserve them. And as we heard from the applicant, and, and I have no information contrary, um, in order to be able to do so, um, they need to be able to make money um, to pay for the cost and to pay for the upkeep. And as a result of that, uh, I think this is a, a unique um, property. I think uh, Mr. Nutter um, made uh, some very salient points uh, as, as the impact that this will have on the Biltmore Avenue corridor. I think it's a very good project here. I understand, again, the, the hotel fatigue uh, that many folks have on this, but I think this is an excellent project for that road, or excuse me, for that stretch. Um, and again, the preservation of those homes if we truly want to say we need to preserve them, um, there needs to be a mechanism by which that is done. Uh, and I think this is an opportunity that is a win-win for the city and for the community. And because of that, I, I enthousi enthusiastically support this project. So as Council Member Mayfield and Council Member uh, Kapoor noted about the preservation of the homes, that's, that's one aspect of it. I can appreciate that. Um, I'm not going to hang my hat on that. As a member of the Housing and Community Development uh, Committee, Councilwoman Mayfield stated that you know we have folks that do come in front of us that need the city's assistance in providing affordable housing for residents of the city, and that is something that I have tried to charge and make part of my mission moving forward, um, providing of those affordable housings. And so, this developer, you know, what we what we want to do is, of course, yes, we want to look at each individual project for its own merit. And what I'm looking for with projects moving forward is the aspect of what is a developer actually doing in the community? Are you, are you just wanting to come to council and say, hey, I've got this hotel, here's a boatload of money, or here's a little bit of money to provide affordable housing. Um, and then we have other developers that are actually doing that. Um, I think, 
I have some issues with some aspects of the project, um, but I also see that the developer is actually working hand in hand with the city and not necessarily needing funds to come through for affordable housing. And that is something that I would like to see more. I would like to see more developers uh, that are working in and out of the city providing affordable housing, uh, working with the city and understanding the needs of the community and not just taking away. Um, this, could easily, this could easily shift and go two separate ways. I mean, we could easily turn this down based on what we've heard here tonight already. Um, but I believe I'm going to support the project. Um, again, I'm not hanging my hat on the preservation of the properties, but um, I think that's an important aspect of it. But I also think it is important to have individuals in this community that share some sorts of an ideology of, of affordable housing and, and what we're actually trying to accomplish here with this. Um, I'm not a yes hotel guy. I'm going to say yes tonight. Um, but as we move forward, it's not an easy yes. It's not something that, that I'm not looking at all aspects of what you bring to the table. Um, there's a whole package of that, and we can do that with, <clears throat> you know, having these things come to us for conditional zonings and, and, and such. But uh, as we move forward, the message to, to everyone else who's coming in front of city council is, in my opinion, you got to do more. You, you have to do more. And, and part of that more is working in the community and providing affordable housing. So I'm gonna say yes tonight. Um, I, I also am gonna support this project and I think um, Keith and Julie have really articulated the reasons why uh, this is you know, a struggle each time. Um, we hear a lot from the community obviously on each one of these projects and we have to take all of that information and try to make the best decision we know how on each one. Um, I will take this opportunity to, because we never talk about this, but um, th these hotels are conditional zonings. And under North Carolina state law, I hate to be such a bore and remind everyone of that, uh, we're, we're actually supposed to make these decisions based on what the statute says we can consider. And what the statute says we can consider is whether or not the proposal meets the um, uh, the is consistent with the comprehensive plan for the city which we adopted in last year um, whether the plan uh, meets the requirements of our ordinance and whether the project addresses any site-specific concerns that it creates so that might be like where the car is going to go in and out or, or something something site specific and that's really all that um, any city council in North Carolina can consider on on a conditional zoning application, which is how how an application even comes to be considered by a city council. But we in Asheville have tried to um, take full advantage of the of the uh, stretches of the statute as we possibly can and broaden our conversation as much as we as much as we can with the applicants to. To, to include a, a lot of things. And I think it would be fair to say that um, our comprehensive plan does address issues of affordable housing and does address the other uh, historic preservation and the other kinds of things that we've discussed here tonight. So um, I just say that to sort of center the conversation um, because I think these cons each one of these applications can get, they can get pretty uh, far afield. Um, but, but for me, again, you know, my final capstone issue continues to be um, the pressure that, that, generally speaking, the tourism industry places on the city balanced with the benefits that it brings. And um, we, we are a tourist town. We always have been a tourist town. Uh, but continuing to grow and balance that tension is a, is a, is a trick for us. Um, as a council, and I continue to be encouraged by the Tourism Development Authority's overtures to the city to work with us on a long-term plan to better fund um, the city's needs for the people that live here, as well as the people that visit here. So as long as we're continuing that conversation in a positive direction, uh, and it results in a concrete plan, um, I will try to consider each one of these on a case-by-case -case basis. 
Okay. Anybody else want to add anything? Yeah. No, I'm just happy oh, to make a motion. Okay. okay. I'm okay. forgetting that hasn't happened. Uh, and a question, do I need to amend, do I, is the condition included or do I need to reference it when I make my motion? You just added it to the B1 right. conditions, Right, I was going right? to say, Sasha, it was added to the B1 conditions and with she the read consent it in. of the developer. So I don't need so to reference I think, it. I think it is a requested condition okay. as referenced in the motion. Okay, great. Uh, I move to approve the rezoning request from Central Business District to Central Business District Expansion Conditional Zone for a lodging facility at 155, 137, 129, and 123 Biltmore Avenue with the requested conditions and find that the request is reasonable is in the public interest and is consistent with the city's comprehensive plan in that the project, one, encourages historic preservation and adaptive reuse, two, is compatible with the surrounding context, three, will improve pedestrian access and infrastructure, and four, is aligned with the future land use map in the Living Asheville Comprehensive Plan. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Any other questions or comments? Okay, I'm gonna make you raise your hand because Maggie's gonna want you to raise your hand. So all those in favor, raise your hand. Okay, all those opposed, raise your hand. Got it? Okay. Thank you. I'll let anybody who was here on that, you can. We, we have one more item on our public hearings agenda. It is item C, a public hearing to consider an amendment to one, chapter seven, article five, and article 15 of the code of ordinances making all subdivisions in historic overlay districts and on local historic landmark property subject to review by the Historic Resources Commission and two, chapter seven, article nine, to make minor corrections. Alex Cole is here. All out. Thank you, Mayor, Mayor Oppheimer and members of the council. Um, Wait, you have to tell us who you are. My name is Alex Cole. I'm a Historic Resources Planner with the Planning and Urban Design Department. I've only presented to you one other time. You um, have, okay, one right, other time. Right. Right. And if you pull the mic to it, you okay. just a little bit. You hear me better. <laughs> You're really sorry. sorry. <laughs> Um, as Mayor Manheimer stated, I'm here to present to you all um, some proposed text amendments to Chapter 7 um, of the UDO. These, uh, the primary sections are 5 and 15, which pertain to subdivision review. Um, currently, the HRC is not involved in any review for proposed subdivisions of land in our four local historic districts or for one of the 48 local landmarks that we have in the city. Um, and over the past few years, since the infill, new infill standards were passed, we've seen an increase in proposed subdivisions, which is wonderful, we're happy to see that. Um, but counter to that, we have run into some issues with proposed subdivisions being approved in the historic district overlays that conflict with the historic district guidelines and primarily those related to setbacks. So I have a couple of examples to briefly go over with you just to help illustrate what we've, um, what we've um, encountered. So this one, I think, I remember talking to um, planning staff about several years ago when it was approved. So as you can see, the. Um, the historic building pattern is, I think it's roughly 50 to 70 feet, or the building setbacks on this side of Cumberland Avenue. Um, this is the newly subdivided lot that's um, subdivided up this huge lot on Cumberland. Um, so in order to meet the historic district guidelines, it would require going for a variance. Um, it would be a, a little bit more challenging to, to meet the historic district <coughs> guidelines in, in terms of being consistent with the historic building pattern. Um, this is a second uh, illustration that I have. This one actually hasn't been approved yet, so it's not shown in the GIS, but basically the subdivision that's proposed is we cut off this front corner, and hopefully you can see by the, by the building footprints there that it's, the buildings are set pretty far back. And that's the illustration of that proposed subdivision. So. Um, this one is actually what really perpetua perpetuated staff to take action and propose the amendment because um, it puts the Historic Resources Commission in a tricky position when they can't necessarily approve a development on this front corner lot. So the pros for the um, pr proposed subdivision are that it would help property owners on the front end to kind of help them understand what 
development issues they may face. Um, so the Historic Resources Commission can address that before the subdivision approval occurs. And so then, to clarify that, the, so you're saying an applicant right now under our current system could go <laughs> seek a subdivision, staff ha has the ability to approve the subdivision, but then it turns out that it's not a buildable lot or that they can't do do what they thought they could do with the lot? Correct. Because it's inconsistent with the historic overlay. Right, correct. And and just so, to clarify a little bit further, the historic resources staff can only advise the applicant. The process doesn't involve us issuing any approval at all at current. So it's routed through DSD for minor subdivisions That's, and Yeah, they approve it. Right. So, so do you imagine that the process now for the HRC review w wouldn't HRC say will show us what you're going to put on the property right so what we would request um, is that they bring in a proposed either a proposed plat or a drawing of the parcel showing roughly where the building footprint they think could go and then that way hopefully we can kind of head this off before it's approved so if someone came to the HRC or to HRC staff we would take this to the Commission and clearly be able to eliminate this issue before the, the so final is it was that approved. is it that the HRC would potentially deny the subdivision approval not because the lot wasn't technically buildable but because of some uh, uh, impacts on the historic preservation or integrity of the remaining parcel I think yes to but I mean I think it's those two things go hand in hand um, because the historic district overlay guidelines require that the that any new development be consistent with the historic development pattern, that they would if they if they would in fact deny an application on a proposed lot like this, which could result in a lawsuit. So that's part of what the the proposed text amendment is for, um, so that we don't run into that issue. Um, since it's at this point, it's not required that the subdivision is first approved by them. Then we have no mechanism to kind of head that off before the plat is approved. So, the HRC is not; they don't have like the end-all power of the subdivision itself, but the proposed development on the lot. So, Which effectively. Um, and I think I went over the benefits, obviously, that they're. Um, to protect from potential lawsuits against the city, and, and it really is to help property owners. We have, I, I feel personally, I feel a lot of phone calls from potential buyers of lots of these subdivisions that have occurred, and they're not that many. I think we've had in our calculations and our permitting system about 11 <coughs> um, in the past three years, um, but this one caused a substantial concern to come to you all to, to request this, this amendment. So. Um, all I can do as a staff person at this point is advise, you know, potential buyers and sellers about what the development issues could be um, in going into the uh, HRC review process. So um, hopefully it will help us provide better customer service as well. Um, so that's really the goal of this text amendment. And just as a side note, the amendments to Section 9 are just some house cleaning um, proposed amendments. So. But happy to answer other questions Any if you have. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, this is a public hearing, so I will open the public hearing. If there's anyone wishing to comment on this item, please raise your hand. Okay, so it's not energizing anyone. All right, yeah. I'll close the public hearing and recognize you for a motion. So I move to approve the wording amendments to UDO articles 5, 9, and 15 to expand standards for sub subdivisions and subdivision plat approvals to require review by the HRC and to clarify the process for obtaining certificates of appropriateness and find that the request is reasonable, is in the public interest, and is consistent with the city's comprehensive plan in that one, helps to sustain a livable built environment by enhancing creative placemaking through pre preservation of neighborhood character and historic resources and two ensures new housing remains compatible with and contributes to the overall character of the existing neighborhood fabric second all right we have a motion and a second any other questions all right all those in favor please say aye aye any opposed all right, that concludes our public hearings agenda. Thank you all. Um, we have um, technically 
well, on item A1 and A2 under unfinished business. This is a resolution authorizing the city manager to negotiate and enter into a grant agreement with the housing authority of the city of Asheville in the amount of $4.2 million from several city funding sources and according to a variable, oh, verifiable performance-based disbursement schedule with the first $1.4 million of that amount dispersed to the housing authority in early May 2019. There is a correlated budget amendment as well. And Paul D'Angelo is here to talk to us about this item. Hi, good evening. Um, city uh, Council, uh, Mayor Esteimer, and City Manager and City Staff, Paul D'Angelo with the Community Development Department to talk to you about uh, this Lee Walker Heights uh, and the $4.2 million grant. I'm going to talk a little bit about the funding. I'm also going to talk about the grant request itself and the disbursement of funds. <coughs> Uh, regarding the funding, there were potential sources in this deal that were considered in 2016. But in order to allow some of that funding to remain flexible, particularly with the city, beach, and home funding uh, for future community needs, a cross-departmental committee uh, recommended that the funding sources replace, uh, current funding sources we're going to recommend replace the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development funds um, with other sources to satisfy the city's um, commitment of $4.2 million. That would be $1.38 million from general fund balance, $1 million from the affordable housing CIP funding, and $1.82 million in the general obligation housing bond. And if note, with that general obligation funding, that money will be used for demolition site work improvements and infrastructure improvements for the benefit of 319 Biltmore, uh, which is adjacent to the Lee Walker Heights uh, property, which is a city-identified city high-impact site. Regarding the request, the Housing Authority has requested that the city's funds be structured as a grant, uh, which the Housing Authority will invest into the project consistent with the low-income housing tax credit requirements. And city staff um, feels this is appropriate based on uh, the important public improvements that the Housing Authority will be completing at 319 Biltmore, the low subsidy per unit to assist our very low uh, AMI area of median income families, a guarantee of permanent affordability, and the importance of neighborhood redevelopment in the future success of the 212 individuals and families that will reside at Lee Walker Heights. The disbursements of funds will be set out over the course of approximately six to eight months, uh, with some of that funding being used for the um, equity um, at the construction finance closing, as well as additional funding being set aside when eligible project costs have been realized on the site, again, over a six to eight month period, totaling 4.2 million um, dollars and those eligible project costs are outlined in the staff report. Staff feels this follows along with City Council goals of an equitable and diverse community, a well-planned and livable community, and quality, affordable housing. Uh, we mentioned many pros in this um, $4.2 million request, uh, to which we wanted to notate that this funding supports 212 new affordable and replacement units that will be permanently affordable with a low subsidy and this aligns with the purpose of the GO housing bonds and making improvements to a city-identified high-impact site um, to show progress on the affordable housing bond. And the suggested mo uh, motion would be to authorize the city manager to negotiate and enter into a grant agreement with the Housing Authority of the City of Asheville in the amount of $4.2 million according to the terms and conditions described in the staff report and resolution and approve a budget amendment in the amount of $1.38 million and appropriate fund balance reserved for the project. There's um, much work behind the scenes on this um, staff report and this grant agreement, um, particularly with working with City Manager Deborah Campbell and also Kathy Ball, Assistant City Manager, as well as the partners at the table, including the Housing Authority, MHO, Weaver Cook, and CDC. And I believe uh, David Nash with the Housing Authority had a few words he'd like to say as well. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you, Paul, Madam Mayor, members of Council. Um, uh, Gene Bell is here and Scott Dedman from Mountain Housing Opportunities. And I'm going to be quick because I've been told to be quick. But I, <laughs> uh, on behalf of all those folks in the Housing Authority and Mountain Housing, um, I want to thank the city manager, um, Kathy Ball, and especially Paul for his tireless efforts in bringing this forward to you. Uh, I'm also here to answer any questions that you may have. And I have one more item if you don't have any questions. Does anyone have any questions? 
Okay. Um, I'd like to ask Tara Irby to come up and talk briefly about the, the employment training opportunities for people in connection with this project. Okay, thanks. Thank you. I am Tara Irby, and for the last year I have served as Lee Walker Heights site manager as well as um, I led the relocation process for our residents there. I'm happy to report that the relocation process is complete and that it was a success. Our residents were able to transition into alternative housing with, um, within our other developments, Asheville Housing Authority developments. They were also able to enter the private market with independent landlords using their tenant mobility vouchers through Section 8. And we are also proud to report that some were able to achieve home ownership through this process as well. I will admit that um, this relocation process was a heavy lift, uh, and not so much as it relates to the physical moves, but of course we know moving has its challenges for everyone, but more so about the um, emotional disconnect that had to be achieved by our residents. They have lived and lived their lives out and um, raised families uh, in this place, and uh, to be able to disconnect from that and then be able to look to the future and with anticipation, uh, it took a lot for them to do that. And it was my, my great honor to be able to assist them in navigating these aspects of transition. And um, I'm, I'm glad to say that we are there. In addition, um, we also um, want to benefit the residents of Lee Walker Heights as well as low income community members by providing additional training or providing training and um, training and employment actually through this project and projects um, in the future. So in collaboration with our community partners, um, Green Opportunities, AB Tech, and uh, our developer Weaver Cook, we are providing training opportunities um, and employment opportunities for the, our residents and low income <coughs> members. By doing so, we feel like that we're providing them with access to um, sustainable jobs as well as living wage jobs. And so we're excited about that. I believe um, Weaver Cook will uh, speak just a little more about that. And, um, and so we are glad to say that our relocation process has um, been successful and that we are working to um, benefit community, uh, our community members even more through this project. Margie from Weaverburg has a brief comment. Mayor and City Council. <clears throat> Weaver Cook is really pleased to be able to work and partner with the Asheville Housing Authority, Mountain Housing Opportunities, AB Tech, and Green Opportunities. Through community outreach and partnering with AB Tech, we're going to be holding job fairs for students and for the community uh, for the construction of Lee Walker Heights. We're hopeful that some of the people that actually will be living in Lee Walker Heights will help construct Lee Walker Heights and what an awesome opportunity that will be for them. We've reached out to more than 25 companies so far in efforts to hire some contractors that are certified MWBE and Section 3. We're also actively helping companies get their certification um, so that they can apply for the work. We are committed to paying living wage to candidates that are NCCER certified through AB Tech and Green Opportunities. And we look forward to helping to establish a new pathway in construction in this city uh, through the Lee Walker Heights <coughs> project, which has great visibility and um, something that we're very excited about and can't wait to get started on. Thank you. So thanks again. We're very excited about the opportunity to replace our 96 of our oldest public housing units with uh, 212 new affordable units within walking distance from some of the jobs that have been created by others and present uh, that will be created by others tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, this, um, this is an item of unfinished business, so we need a motion. Um, on item A1, 
first, and then I'll take any public comment. So I move to authorize the city manager to negotiate and enter into a grant agreement with the Housing Authority of the City of Asheville in the amount of $4.2 million according to the terms and conditions described in the staff report and resolution and approving a budget amendment in the amount of $1,380,000 to appropriate fund balance reserved for the project. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second on item A1. Is there anyone wishing to speak on the motion to approve item A1 under the unfinished business portion of our, of our agenda? Can I just yeah. say one quick word oh. since nobody did? Um, I just want to say, since I don't know if this is going to come before us again, maybe this is the last time, but. Um, <laughs> no, no, these things come. Over, <laughs> They're going to keep over. coming, oh, okay. Over, over. Well, anyway, I just want to, again, thank, um, uh, thank the Housing Authority, David and Jean, uh, for your great work on this, and Tara for the work that you've done with the residents. Um, I'm sure that was a, um, a, a difficult and challenging thing, and I know you've done it with grace and an open heart, and I really appreciate that. Um, uh, and uh, MHO, Scott, for, for partnering on this, it's going to be a great project. And then um, Weaver Cook for really digging in on the Section 3 stuff and the minority and women business-owned businesses. Uh, this is This has been a conversation that we've been having around the home consortium table about how do we how do we let? Um, how do we how do we help all of this boom in our in our construction really benefit the the lowest income folks? And Weaver Cook, you've been at those tables and in those discussions from the beginning, and, and I really just appreciate you stepping up in a way that not really anybody else has. So thank you. Um, this will be a great example, and then we can be on to the next one. Yes, that is true. I'm looking at Jean as Weaver <laughs> and Dave. We have um, already started a preliminary conversation about that. Um, since now we've learned how long this takes, what is it, uh, five and a half years <laughs> before we break ground? So, um, so uh, this is really exciting. And I know um, it was easy enough for us to sit up here and say, this is something we want to support. Now go figure out how to make it work. So thanks to all of you that have done done just that. Um, so you're, you're um, allowing us to partner with you in something that I, I know will be great for Asheville. So with that, we have a motion and a second. Anyone else to comment? All right, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? And then on item A2, I also need a motion for that. Cool. I think it's I so that I was included that I did a bunch of Did we do an all-in-oneer? Was that okay? Yeah, we did. Okay, <laughs> never mind. Then fine. Then we're concluded. Is that an that. official expression? Yeah, an all in all one That's an all-in-oneer under unfinished business. <laughs> all right, thank you all very much. Um, we're, we've got one final item on our agenda. Um, but I appreciate that you were here. There's a lot of people. Um, we have one final item under new business, uh, the appointment of members of the Asheville City Board of Education, and I'm going to turn it over to the Vice Mayor for this portion of the agenda. Thank you. So this morning, uh, this council interviewed seven applicants for the school board uh, members, and uh, just to remind everyone, what we what will we be voting on is for two people to t have a full four-year term and then one person to fill out or the remainder of Mr. Lee's term, which is two more years. So uh, what I'm going to ask, so, so we all interviewed them this morning, so everybody met them all. And uh, so what, I, what I'd like to do is ask you to vote for two people first for the four-year term and then we'll come around the second time and vote for um, the, the one person to fill out the two-year term. Does that make sense? So I'm going to start with uh, Councilman Kapoor for the so for two two for the two four -year for the four-year term. Uh, I I would uh, vote for uh, Geithner and Sanford. I'm sorry. Geithner and, and Sanford. And Sanford. Uh, oh, he's. I'm saying the last <laughs> names. I'm sorry. Mr. Haynes. Uh, Geithner and Sanford also. Um, and I, first, I just want to say 
uh, to all the applicants, thank you so much for applying. We, um, we make it especially challenging when you apply <laughs> for the school board in particular, because you have to not only apply, then we send you a set of um, essay questions, and then you have to come and interview live here in this chamber. So I know a lot of people, that's a fairly intimidating process, and I, I wanna thank those that went through it. We had a lot more that started, but not, not as many that finished the process out. Um, and we have also heard an overwhelming amount of community support for the reappointment of Sanford and Geithner, and I, I am I'm going to vote to reappoint Sanford and Geithner. Councilman Young. Sanford and Geithner. Same thing, Sanford and Geithner. Same for me, Sanford and Geithner. Okay, that makes that unanimous. So now, uh, so Martha Geithner and Sandra and Shonda Sanford. Did you vote? Yes, well? I said that makes it unanimous, sorry. Okay, so, yeah, all right. that was, yeah. uh, okay, so on this next round, what I need you to do is vote for one person to fill out the remaining two-year terms uh, with uh, Mr. Lee, who has um, resigned. So, um, Councilman Smith? James Carter. Carter? Okay. Mr. Acebo? Mr. Young. James Carter. Acebo. James Brown. Carter. James Carter. Mr. Kapoor. Carter. And I am uh, Mr. Carter. So that is five to two for James Carter. Again, uh, really appreciate all, I mean, it's a lot of work to just even, <laughs> as the mayor said, to even apply for this. And this is a big job and very important. Um, it's one of the, it's really one of the very few things that, that city council has a direct effect on this, the city schools and we take these appointments very, um, we, we take them to heart and, and spend a lot of time thinking about them and so we really appreciate all the interest in the school and, and, uh, and interested in making, making it a better place. Thank you. All right, that concludes the printed agenda. I have one person signed up to speak, and that is Sarah Ben, I think, I hope I'm I think saying this right, Benoit. Benoit. You'll tell me if I'm not saying it right. Um, folks that are signed up or otherwise want to speak during the public comment period should just state your name, and you'll have three minutes. Thank you. Okay, did we get the last name? Correct. Benoit. Benoit. Ah, yeah. See? You, you were on it. You were on it. So good evening, everyone. My name is Sarah Benoit, <laughs> and I'm here again to speak briefly about the importance of fighting to keep our at-large election districts in place. Um, to begin, I just want to say that two weeks ago was the first time that I've sat through a city council meeting since Lenny Sitnik was mayor, and I was reminded of what a complex and difficult job that you all have, so I appreciate you. Um, tonight, I'm here to ask all of you to take action to protect our voting districts here in Asheville. I believe that this is essential if we want to continue to have fair <coughs> elections and to allow our community to be educated, to debate, and to vote about the issues that affect us the most, instead of making every vote simply an exercise in partisanship and gerrymandering, where no matter how much organizing we do, elections become predictable and also predetermined to ignore the needs of particular groups of people. Last time I was here, I talked about how important it was for us to build not only a stronger, healthier, more equitable Asheville, but also a stronger, healthier, and more equitable North Carolina. I also believe that for all minority groups to be truly represented and have the opportunity to bring much needed change to our city, we need to maintain the at-large elections. As a member of the LGBTQ community, I see my friends, colleagues, and chosen family across North Carolina struggling to affect change in their communities because their ability to do that is slowly deteriorating. My own partner of 17 years is a transgender woman, and over the last few years, as the laws in North Carolina have become increasingly threatening and what we feel is unfair, for the first time since we moved here and met in 2001, we have asked ourselves if we need to just leave North Carolina. We don't always feel confident that in the long run we live in a state that protects our rights or quite honestly even cares whether or not our voices are heard. I don't believe state leadership considers us constituents. I believe they think of us as more of a nuisance. 
And so we have to rely on our local officials to stand up for us and to acknowledge our contributions as taxpayers, business owners, North Carolinians, and Americans. Other counties and cities have fought the state's attempts to redraw voting districts and won. I believe in Asheville we need to stand with those communities. So I urge each of you to do more than just speak out against gerrymandering, but fight it and take action against it to be a part of ending what I believe is a terrible practice in North Carolina, instead of telling us that it's quote unquote inevitable. Again, I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Is there anyone else wishing to speak on any item that was not on our printed agenda? Yes, sir. Hello, my name is Jonathan Wayne Scott. It's the first council meeting of spring, so it's like the council equinox. Uh, <laughs> I was uh, hustling down here on the Feptem uh, February 12th uh, council meeting. You guys wrapped up really quickly, and I was late getting here because I had car trouble. Kind of car, uh, it overheated in my driveway a little mm -hmm. bit. Uh, but I wanted to talk about the district elections. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I was at the Board of Elections uh, office earlier that day on the 12th and asking about what was going on with the map, which is basically the proof of whether or not gerrymandering has actually taken place. I mean, we need that data set in order to be able to sue the state for injury. I mean, what basically are the demographic ratios in each of these districts? And the hangup has been that the city won't sign off on the map because we didn't have an attorney yet, and I guess we're getting one. And so what I'd like to suggest is that signing off on the map will then give us the information that we need to know whether or not gerrymandering has actually taken place in the community. And it doesn't really preclude us from suing the state if that has happened. And you know, it adds legitimacy to any referendum that we're going to have over the matter. Because if we don't have the information, we could be unwittingly deconstructing the situation of the district elections that we have now, which is law, which is actually beneficial to the Af African American community. And that's just math, and that will be shown in the data. So we don't need to go back and forth whether or not this is gerrymandering, it's not gerrymandering. We actually have to see the map, the city has to sign off on it, and then that needs to get done. It's not really pressing because the election isn't until uh, 2020 when you'll be running for Senate. but. Um, the Board of Elections does need to get the maps drawn by June because of a federal uh, pressure to do that. They've already run out of their extensions to get that done. So it's sort of like, don't really have to hurry up on a day-to-day -day city kind of functioning way, but it seems like getting this distraction out of the way would be a wonderful thing. So thanks for taking the time. Good luck with the Senate. I hope everybody has a wonderful spring. And I uh, agree with you on the hotel thing. And have a nice night. Thanks. <laughs> Um, so just to clarify, I'm getting a head shake on the sign-off part. Um, I know that the data set was sent from the legislature to the Buncombe County Board of Elections, so I don't... I'm Actually, there was confusion about that. It was not, but it's since been provided by the city to the Buncombe County Board of Elections, what we were provided by the legislature. Yeah, so all I don't know good. why they did it that I way. I don't either, but, but it's all taken care of. But <clears throat> so, the, so the maps were drawn by the legislature and the... I guess what the clarification is here, for some reason, they sent them to the city, even though the city is not the one that conducts elections. So we have forwarded that information to the Board of Elections. I don't know that any city action is required at all. In fact, if it were, and that's all it took, that would be interesting to know. Right. Um, OK, is there anyone else who would like to speak under the public comment portion of our agenda? All right, if not, we have a closed session motion. We do. I move that Asheville City Council go into closed session for the following reasons. It should prevent disclosure of information that is privileged and confidential pursuant to the laws of North Carolina or not considered a public record within the meaning of Chapter 132 of General Statutes. The law that makes the information privileged and confidential is North Carolina General, General Statute 143 through 318 10A3. The statutory authorization is contained in North Carolina General Statute 143 through 318 11A1. To consult with an attorney employed by the city about matters with respect to which the attorney-client privilege between the city and its attorney must be preserved, including but not limited to a lawsuit or potential lawsuit involving the following parties. The estate of John Latif Savage Williams versus Sergeant Tyler Kelly Radford and the city of Asheville versus Bird, Bird Rides.
statutory authorization is contained in North Carolina General Statute 143 through 318 11A3. All right, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. second. All right, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? We will adjourn from the closed session.